Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll be right back with today's guest, but we want to give a shout out to our podcast partners, the Global Community of Women in High School Sports, the Florida Coaches Coalition, Vital Signs Wall of Fame, and We Coach. You really need to add these four groups to your network. Check them out, see what they can do for you and your program. And now, don't push that fast forward button. Stay with us for the next three minutes. Take a listen to our podcast sponsor messages. Here we go. We want to say thanks to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Go to hometownticketing.com. They're going to show you how to set up and sell your tickets online, not just for your athletic events, but for things like concerts, plays, school dances, even graduation. And the best part, every step of the way, you're going to have a dedicated client success manager providing hands-on support. That's every step of the way. Go to hometownticketing.com right now and get started. Simple and easy online ticketing. That's hometown ticketing. We also want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive indoor score tables and video boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com right now. Schedule a live web demo and see their tables and their boards in action. It's probably one of the best purchases I ever made as an athletic director. Their products are extremely versatile and their customer service is just outstanding. That's sidelineinteractive.com. Check them out today. We also want to say thanks to Gipper. Go to gipper.com and see how athletic directors are creating world-class marketing content for their school's social media channel. You can do it in seconds on any device. Go to gipper.com. Tell them you heard about it on the podcast and use our code ADPOD10. You'll get 10% off. Start creating custom content for your school's social media channel at gipper.com. We also want to say thanks to Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame is an interactive touchscreen video console that highlights your school's top performers, both past and present, in athletics, academics, and the arts. But it's so much more than that. The Wall of Fame is also an extensive content program that allows you to tell more compelling stories to better engage your audience. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com, check out the great products, and when you're ready to buy, use the link vitalsignswalloffame.com slash Jake for a nice discount. Bring your school's legacy to life at Vital Signs Wall of Fame. We also want to say thanks to Snap Mobile. Snap Mobile is the parent company for an entire suite of platforms that you can find by going to snapraise.com and check them out. SnapRaise is also their fundraising platform. We've used it at our school with great success, and so can you. They even have a program where they'll give you your money before you actually start your fundraiser. I don't think anybody else offers that. Go to SnapRaise.com. Get started today. SnapRaise.com. We also want to thank Huddle. Go to Huddle.com and change the way you see the game. Huddle is going to provide your school your coaches, your teams, your athletes with the tools that they need to play at the highest level. It's going to be a complete professional grade solution. You'll really be impressed. Go to huddle.com and see why we believe in sports and teams believe in huddle. Join the 6 million users. Turn your school into a huddle school. And we want to thank Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Athletic surveys are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire program. ADs typically only hear back from that 2% that want to gripe, the squeaky wheel parent, or maybe it's a frustrated student athlete, and we need to hear from them. But we also need to hear back from the 98% that really love and support our program, and that's where athletic surveys comes in. They're going to create a custom survey to allow you to take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. So go to athleticsurveys.com. Get started today. That's athleticsurveys.com. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. This is one of our back to college episodes. We're going to be meeting with John Phillips. John is the director of athletics at Embry-Riddle University right here in Florida, Daytona Beach. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Embry-Riddle, they have a tremendous uh, academic program, uh, and they also got a pretty darn good athletic program, too. So we're excited to hear how John uh, manages to combine those two disciplines. So, John Phillips, welcome to the Educational AD Podcast. Uh, it's great to be with you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk more about Embry-Riddle and, uh, and share some of this info with your listeners. So uh, thanks for the offer. Uh, we're excited to have you on. I've actually been on your campus uh, a couple of times. We had uh, one of the high schools where I was the AD. One of our volleyball players came and played at Embry-Riddle. That was a few years ago. And uh, just this year, I was there as a track official for one of your home track meets. And I know that's one of your high-powered programs. So, um, John, we always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So, Give us that quick bio, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, maybe high school and college years, and then we'll take our first break and then come back and hear more about your early career. But what's the John Phillips origin story? Yeah, no, it's 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 pretty unique, Jake. It's, uh, you know, if, if you if you look up the, 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 the route to becoming an AD, I certainly didn't follow it. Um, I was I was born and raised in uh, in Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C., and uh yeah, you know, my dad worked for NASA, and uh, so I grew up in the, kind of the you know a fan of the space industry and things like that. And that part makes sense of why I'm here at Embry Riddle. Uh, but out of high school, I w actually went into the military. I spent some time in the Air Force. Uh, I worked in the F-15 industry. I was at Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, and while I was at Langley Air Force Base, I started doing some uh, what at the time would have been considered distance learning uh, through. Embry Riddle of all places, and uh, and one of the reasons I chose to to, to go to school at Embry Riddle is because they gave credit for your military experience, and of course I had a pretty significant amount of military experience. So I started going to Embry Riddle on on base, and then uh, one thing led to another. This was in the late 1980s. Uh, the, the the Air Force was having some some force reductions. Quite honestly, the uh, the, the Cold War uh, was kind of wrapping up. And the Gulf War hadn't started. So that gives you the time frame when I was on active duty it was 1984 through 1989. And uh, so they were they were letting people uh, get out early. I, I had been in for a little over five years and uh, got offered an opportunity to uh, to come back here to Embry-Riddle uh, full time. So I left the military, uh, transitioned out and came to Daytona Beach to become a full time student. And I needed 30 credits to graduate. I thought I'd be here for the fall, I'd be here for the spring, and then I'd go back to the Washington, D.C. area, and that would be the end of my time in Daytona Beach. Uh, well, I've been here now, that was 1989 when I came here, and uh, so I guess I've been here for 34 years, and I've never left. Uh, so it, it, it's uh, I, I came here to go to school. We were just starting our athletic program. I walked on and made the baseball team. I was actually a pretty good baseball player in high school. I didn't know that I was actually any good, to be totally honest with you, because I played on a really, really good travel baseball program, and I was an average to below average player on that team. Uh, also played football in high school, was probably a better football player, just very undersized to play football at the next level. Um, but on my travel baseball team, six of the guys on my team went on to play professional baseball. So when I say I was below, below average, the, the bar was pretty high. I just didn't know it. Uh, so ultimately I, I got here to Daytona. I walked on, I made the baseball team, uh, ended up playing for, uh, for three years. I stayed to go to graduate school so I could keep playing, uh, cause I felt like I got the rest of my life to work Daytona beach and playing college baseball is pretty cool. Just keep doing it. Uh, I had no business thought of working in college athletics, none. Our athletic program at the time was very, very small. It was a glorified club program. Barely had any scholarship funding. We had no athletic facilities on campus. Um, but my senior year, we 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 were in the we were in the growth phase, and we hired our first ever full time coach here at Embry Riddle to be the baseball coach, Greg Williams. He's now the baseball coach at Valdosta State University up in Valdosta, Georgia. Um, when we when we got a real coach and our program grew, I got it. I I got to feel like oh, this is what college athletics really was meant to be. Uh, it was a really different experience. So one thing led to another. I stayed here in the local area. I was not working at Emory Riddle. And about five years later, I, I had a conversation at an alumni event with our athletic director at the time. And I said, one day when the athletic program gets big enough that you need somebody to market it and promote it in the community, I would love to talk to you about that. I really wasn't looking for a job that day. 
I don't know what motivated me to say that to the guy, but I did. And let's see, it was about six months later, seven months later, I got hired <laughs> uh, as the director of sports marketing and promotions. Uh, I had never worked in sports marketing. <laughs> Prior to that, I'd never worked in college athletics, but I had been a college athlete. And uh, so uh, I just kind of took the long road from there. One thing led to another, to an assistant AD job, an associate AD job. And then nine years ago, got promoted into the athletic director's role. Uh, and I've been here uh, now as a full-time employee for 26 years. So uh, I have an undergraduate degree in professional aeronautics, a master's degree in aeronautical science, and none of those things make any sense for a collegiate athletic director. But at Embry-Riddle, it does make sense. And I have great passion for this institution. They gave me a chance to, to play college athletics. And now I love being able to uh, pass it along to our current students and give them an opportunity to pursue a great education, but also a really, really great uh, NCAA Division II athletic program. So uh, it's it's been fun, but it's been a unique journey. Uh, and again, people have heard me say this before. I just love listening to the stories. Um, and your degree has got to, degrees, excuse me, got to come in handy if you're having that conversation um, you know, with a student athlete, uh, probably rare at Embry Riddle, uh, who's complaining about, you know, the vigor uh, of a particular course. You can say, hey, you know, this is what it is at Embry Riddle. Yeah. I want to go back to um, maybe those early years uh, for you uh, mm -hmm. as a student athlete at Embry Riddle, maybe even that senior year when you said you finally got the, you know, the full time coach. Um, what were or were there uh, any lessons or events that really stick out for you as an undergrad student athlete that you still remember and maybe lean on that lesson as a college athletic director? Oh yeah. You know, you know, Greg, uh, Greg Williams is our head coach and his brother Todd uh, was our assistant coach. And uh, those two guys were great leaders, uh, great mentors uh, and phenomenal baseball coaches, but more important than that, they were just great, great leaders of men. And uh, some of the things they taught us was attention to detail um, and, and having a big picture game plan and not just approaching things. Just do this, do that, do this. No, we're going to be strategic. We're going to go about this the right way. And we have a, a foundation we're going to build. And then we're going to add to it, add to it, and add to it. And they took that approach in everything they did. If you came to one of our practices in 1992, which would have been the, the spring of my senior year, you would see a very detailed outline for practice. Very, very efficient. 3 o'clock to 3.05, we're going to stretch. 3.05 to 3.20, we're going to do BP. 3.20 to 3.28, we're going to do infield. It wasn't just roll the balls out and go do this and do a little of that and see how it goes. It was planned, detailed, and prepared. And, uh, and it, it, it was really a great life lesson. It worked well in the sport of baseball, but it works well in virtually anything you oh, do. Absolutely. Have a plan. Be strategic. You know, they talk about... Uh, you know, what's one of the quotes about uh, the, if, if you uh, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, and then I think there was one, maybe it goes back to like uh, Abraham Lincoln or something talked about if I had to chop down a tree, I'd spend five hours sharpening the axe or some, something to that effect. Um, you know, th th those things were really good life lessons of, uh, of doing your preparation ahead of time. Uh, and not just, you know, show up. And, and well, that was one of, one, of, one of their great quotes was we don't just show up and roll the balls out. Um, you know, we, we have a, we have a really good game plan to go about our business. No, absolutely. And great advice for, you know, coaches or ADs is, you know, having that plan, you know, now it's very fashionable to say, you know, you need to be intentional. Okay. Well, yeah. no kidding. Really? Okay. Um, for our listeners, uh, our guest today is John Phillips. He's the director of athletics at Embry Riddle university in Daytona beach, Florida. We're going to take our first break, but we'll be back with some more. So please stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. Use it. That's okay. Hey, we want to thank Hometown Ticketing for their support of the podcast. Go to hometownticketing.com. They're going to show you how to sell tickets for your events online, digitally, not just athletic events, but things like concerts, uh, school plays, dances, even graduation. And the best part, every step of the way, you're going to have a dedicated client success manager that's providing hands-on support. That's every step of the way. Go to hometownticketing.com. They're the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. 
We also want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive, indoor score tables and video boards. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive indoor score table. We don't not only use it for home games, but we use it for signing ceremonies, for pep rallies. Their products are tremendously versatile, and the customer service is just outstanding. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, schedule a live web demo, and see their tables and their boards in action. That's sidelineinteractive.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest today is John Phillips, the Director of Athletics at Embry-Riddle University. John, you talked a little bit about, you know, your uh, path to Embry-Riddle, and and uh, it's it's kind of been a career for you. Share a little bit about those early days, you know, maybe when you came on board in, in uh, marketing or maybe, you know, early days as an AD. What were some of the challenges you faced, you know, building a program that, again, is, is recognized on a national level um, and maybe offer a little bit of advice to a high school AD in that same position? Yeah, no, it, it, we, we definitely started from the ground up, quite literally. Um, you know, we spent, well, the athletic program started in 1989. Just give you a quick history lesson. We didn't build our first on-campus facility until 1995. So we were fortunate when I was on the baseball team, we played at Jackie Robinson Ballpark, which is now the home of the Daytona Tortugas today. At that time, there was no minor league baseball in Daytona Beach. So it was our home. Uh, we practiced and played all our home games there. It was fantastic, uh, but it was off campus. And so we had very little fan support because it, it, it wasn't on campus. All of our other sports were off campus as well. Uh, our basketball team played at Mainland High School uh, or at Daytona State College, and our, so our soccer team bounced around between a field in Daytona and a field in DeLand, which is about 30 minutes away. Yeah. Um, that's your home game. Uh, our tennis team was down at Pelican Bay Country Club, and of course, our golf team was off campus, and and, and they they still are off campus, so uh, probably always will be. But we we had no facilities, we had no scholarships, and uh, but we were we were in our infancy. Uh, when I came on board as a full-time staff member, fast forward a little ways, that was 1997. At that point, we did have uh, the ICI Center, which is where we play our volleyball and, and, and basketball games. Uh, and we had added a soccer uh, a soccer field to our, uh, to our inventory. And that was it. Everything else was still off campus. Uh, so I uh, learned a lot of lessons just about uh, paying your dues and uh, – the quote unquote other duties as a sign, yeah. uh, no matter what your role was at that time, everybody had something else they were going to do. Uh, in addition to being the person in charge of sports marketing, I did the public address announcing. Sometimes I ran the scoreboard. Sometimes uh, we, we all just chipped in and did whatever it took to, to, to grow the program. In 1995, we had six sports. So we had added our first women's sport. It was volleyball. Um, and then we've grown from there. So now today we have 20 sports and almost 500 student athletes, uh, almost a 50, 50 split between male and female, uh, which is actually ironic because at Embry Riddle, our student body makeup is about 75, 25 male dominated because of our aviation and aerospace leaning. So, um, we are much more closer to 50, 50 in athletics than, than the campus is. We, we have used women's sports as an enrollment driver and builder for the university. It's a very unique situation that not a lot of schools do that. Most schools struggle to find the male female balance for title nine because football is that big offset sport that there's no women's equivalent. And even if there is flag football at the high school level, there's not the roster size that you would see right. for a, for a, for a, for a, for a boys football team. So while most schools try to fight and add women's sports to create balance, we were we were the other way around. We were trying to add women's sports to just to get more women on campus. But the bottom line is we we all grew together from six sports to 20 didn't happen overnight. It was a sport here and there and there and there. And so we added facilities. We improved our infrastructure. We added more full time coaches and overall just grew what we refer to as our program. And listeners who have been a part of your podcast before are probably very familiar with that terminology. You can have a great sport where you're good on the field or the court, or you can have a great program, which is where you have great coaches and great parents and great boosters and great sportsmanship and great facilities. Those are the things that make up a 
program. And so we feel like without patting ourselves on the back too much, we have tried to build an athletic program, not just good teams. We want to be successful in the classroom. We want to be successful in the community. And we also want to be successful in the competitive space, whether that be our rowing team on the water, our track and field team on the track, or our basketball team on the court, we still like to be competitive. As long as they're keeping score, we might as well try to win. Uh, but not at the expense of the first two. That's something that's critical. The student right. first, the person, and then the player. That's one of our mantras. If you come on campus at Emory Riddle, you'll see it blasted all over the place. That's our brand, student, person, player, in that order. Uh, so we feel like we've 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 worked through some things, but you know, myself and others who have been here for a long time, we've kind of paid our dues and we knew what it was like before. I mean, our men's basketball team played five seasons, not five games five seasons in a middle school as their home gym. We're not too big for our britches here. We know where we came from. We are fortunate to have a beautiful facility today, but we also have been around long enough to remember what it was like back in the day and paying our dues and sweeping the floor and, uh, you know, having a somebody be the PA announcer who's a volunteer and working in the concession stand or wh- whatever job was necessary, everybody was willing to do. Let's go and follow up on that thought. And, and again, you're in a unique position to have that perspective, you know, historical and, and hands-on. Mm-hmm. What was the moment for you, or maybe it's moments, where you said to yourself, um, we've made it. And I know mm-hmm. you're never going to be satisfied. You're always going to yeah. be trying to do better, as we all should. But was there that one moment where you just said, wow, we're up? And these are my words, not yours. You know, we're a real program now. Yeah, there's probably been two uh, during my time here. And and, and I've been here for quite a while. The first one that comes to mind, it happened in March of 2000. Uh, Our men's basketball team won the NAIA National Championship. That was a pretty, pretty momentous day. To win a national championship in any sport is a big deal. But if you think about it, we only started playing the sport of basketball in 1989. So 11 years from no facility, no scholarships, no uniform, no coach to a national championship. Um, That was quite an accomplishment uh, to do it, period, but to do it in that short of a time frame. That, that, That was a big, big deal. And it's not just for that one sport. It was for them. You know, it, we don't have football. If you're at a small college that doesn't have football, more often than not, your your basketball team becomes your flagship program. And uh, and and for us, for us, it was no different. Uh, basketball was our flagship program. We had made the national tournament uh, in four consecutive years leading up to that. Uh, but we had never gotten past the second round. Until that year in in in, in two thousand when we won the uh, when we won the whole thing, the other kind of breakthrough moment was when we got accepted uh, into the NCAA, uh, and that official call came from the NCAA headquarters in uh, in in the summer of twenty seventeen, and so that was a three year process when you apply for candidacy to join the NCAA and go through the membership process, which 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 takes three full years uh, to go through. But to met all the hurdles, all the compliance standards, had the site visits, you know, been been put through the through the ringer, put put through the test, uh, and then to ultimately get that phone call from the NCAA. I would, I remember it vividly. I was sitting in our president's office, and uh, they told us to expect a call at you know two o'clock. I think it was two o'clock that day. It was a Friday. I remember that, and uh, and so I'm upstairs in the president's office and just waiting for the phone to ring, and it was like. What are they going to say? <laughs> and all of our staff was downstairs in the lobby of the of, of the president's building and just waiting for us to walk out after the phone call to say, and we got the thumbs up. And uh, so that was a, that was a breakthrough for us. It was, uh, it was a heck of a lot of work by a lot of people on our staff to, uh, to, to have grown our program to that point. But yeah, that, even that, and that was 2017. So again, let's go back. 1989. No athletics, none, no facilities, no nothing. 28 years. That's a that's a fairly long time, but to go from zero to to a to a division two program 
what was a great was a great accomplishment for our institution and our university, and I was thrilled to uh, to be part of it. Oh, absolutely. And and again, you know, going back to the national championship, um, NAI is, is a tough level. Okay, you know that that's not just uh, rec ball. You know that that's oh, yeah. real. That's real competition. And uh, I, I know a couple of schools, uh, ads that have made that same transition to NCAA over the years. And, uh, you know, they, they're telling me the same thing. Just so cool. So exciting. You know, waiting for that phone call. Uh, great stuff. Thanks for sharing that. For our listeners, our guest today is John Phillips. He's the director of athletics at Embry-Riddle University in Daytona Beach, Florida. We're going to take another break, but we'll be back with some more. This is the Educational AD Podcast. The podcast also wants to say thanks to Gipper for their support. Go to Gipper.com and see how athletic directors are creating world-class marketing content for their school social media channel. Use our podcast code ADPOD10 and you'll get 10% off. Start creating custom content for your school social media channel on Gipper.com. We also want to thank Wall of Fame by Vital Signs. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. The Wall of Fame is actually an interactive touchscreen video console that's going to highlight your school's top performers, both past and present, in athletics, academics, and the arts. But it's so much more than that. The Wall of Fame is also an extensive content program that allows you to tell more compelling stories to better engage your audience. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com, check out their great products, and when you're ready to buy, Use the link vitalsignswalloffame.com slash Jake, and you'll get a nice discount. Vital Signs Wall of Fame, bringing your school's legacy to life. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. John, we always like to allow our guests the opportunity to acknowledge the mentors that they've had in their life. Uh, None of us get to where we're at on our own. Uh, the expression that I use uh, is I still hear the voices of my mentors in my head. Uh, so do you have any voices that you still hear? Oh, yeah, no doubt. We could uh, this this segment could go on for hours, probably, Jake. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it clearly it, it, it starts at home with my mom and dad uh, and, the, and the family relationship that we grew up in. I'm the youngest of five. I have four older sisters um, and there's pretty good age gap between my oldest sister is 13 years older, and then 12 years older, 11 years older, and eight years older. And so then there's little me. <laughs> and so in some ways, I grew up with uh, with with five mothers toting me all around the place. But, uh, you know, that, that volunteer mentality, and I'll tell a little story, and, and I'm really fortunate both my parents are still living, uh, but they have both dedicated their life to service. My dad, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, worked for NASA for 37 years. So that was his career. But he also spent a great deal of time uh, as a volunteer firefighter uh, uh, in a small town in Maryland. And my mom was part of the fire department as well. She ran what they called the canteen, where if there was a long fire and they're going to be there for a couple, two hours, you got to have hot chocolate in the wintertime or Gatorade in the summertime. And so uh, she and a lot of the other firemen's wives had this canteen operation. But without going into too much detail there, but my, my parents have dedicated more than 60 years of their lives to be in volunteer, uh, involved in the volunteer fire department in some way. Um, and so that, I think, volunteer service was ingrained for me in a very young age. And oftentimes I would go to the firehouse with my parents if they had a meeting or an event to go to. And I just saw what the important thing was about giving back to your community. And so I think that was instilled in me in a very early age. Uh, another couple of mentors for me would be youth baseball coaches. Again, I, I talked about earlier, I grew up in the right outside of Washington, D.C., in the suburbs of Maryland. Had some very competitive, uh, what would be considered today, travel uh, travel sports teams. Uh, I played in the Capital Beltway League in football. And so we traveled to Northern Virginia and D.C. and around Maryland playing playing tackle football growing up. And a, and a coach by the name of Mike Beck, we were too young to realize we were being mentored. You know, we were just having a good time playing football uh, and, we, and we were pretty successful, uh, won three consecutive Capital Beltway League championships and got to travel around the D.C. area and play some pretty competitive football. And uh, I, I was a quarterback. And so uh, I, I spent a lot of time 
under the outstretched arm of, uh, of coach Mike Beck, getting some guidance and mentoring and hopefully, you know, serving as a team captain and uh, trying to, trying to help lead my football team. And, and again, I didn't even realize I was being mentored uh, by him. He was just my coach. And, uh, and then in the sport of baseball, similar, we, 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 we traveled around the DC area and, and played at a pretty good level uh, baseball coach by the name of Gene Haran. And uh, again, just didn't realize how good of a man and good of a leader he was because I was, you know, 12 and 13 and 14 years old, just getting ready to go to high school. Um, but just really great coaching from a young age uh, up there in, in that area. And then, of course, you fast forward to Embry Riddle. And I spoke earlier about Greg Williams, my, my head coach, and Todd Williams, who was our assistant when I was a college baseball player, uh, certainly taught me the game of baseball at the highest level I've ever been taught. And uh, and really just taught me how to run a run a program and conduct a practice and and organize a team and and build for success. Uh, they were really, really good at that. And then, you know, clearly the best mentor to me professionally has been our former athletic director, uh, Steve Ritter. Uh, he is actually still our basketball coach here. Uh, he's been the uh, basketball coach for 34 years now, but for 20 of his 34, he also was the athletic director. He was in both roles. He's the guy who hired me to become the director of sports marketing and then mentored me and led me along to ultimately take over for him. Uh, when, when you're a new division two school, you're not allowed to have the athletic director be a coach. So if you're already in the NCAA, that's okay. And there are some small colleges where the athletic director is still coaching, but as a transitioning school, it's not permitted. So coach Ritter had to make a decision to either keep coaching basketball or keep being AD, but he couldn't do both when we decided to move uh, into the NCAA. And obviously we, we know what decision he made uh, because I got this job and uh, he's still our basketball coach and arguably one of the most successful basketball programs in the country. He's won over 750 games. Uh, he's in probably six different halls of fame. Uh, he's just an outstanding leader, mentor, coach, friend. And uh, it's also really, really great to have a 20 year former athletic director in the office next door. So when you have a question or a need or a concern or, hey, this happened today or how do you handle this? I don't have to pick up the phone and call anybody. I just walk out the door and go into the office across the hall and and ask somebody who's been in my chair quite literally uh, for, for 20 years how he handled it. And, and he uh, 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 and, and I and others have been together for a long, long time. I'm really fortunate. You know, he, he's he's been here for 34 years. He came the same year I came. I came as a student athlete. He came as the basketball coach. So we have been together, not in the same relationship because uh, I didn't play for him, but I, but, but, but I knew him and I, and I respected him greatly when I was a baseball player here. And then of course we've been coworkers for the last 26 years together, but I've got four or five other employees on my staff that have been here more than 25 years as well. So we are really fortunate to have some great longevity. Uh, and I think that's one of the keys to our success. Um, we have built a great culture that people want to be part of. And we oftentimes you have to leave a job for personal growth, to get to the next level, to do more. Well, we started with six sports and no facilities. Now we have 20 and some of the best facilities in division two. So we have allowed people to not have to leave to grow. You stay here and grow with us. And uh, I think that's been one of the keys to our success of the culture we've built here of, uh, of teamwork, and uh, all supporting one another and, uh, and and building what we think is one of the best small college athletic programs in the country. You know, you've talked a couple of times about, uh, you know, culture and, and program. Obviously, you have it there. And what a great resource. Uh, we always talk about building uh, for a young AD uh, or a young coach, you know, to build your network and have those go-to people. What a great resource to have, oh, yeah. uh, Steve, there. Um who are some people outside of Embry Riddle that are part of your network that when a question comes up, like you said, you can give them a call. Hey, you know, how have you ever dealt with this? Anybody come to yeah. mind real quick? Yeah, there's, there, there's a bunch probably. And, and, we're, and I'm, I guess I'm fortunate in some ways we were in the NAIA in the sun conference for a number of years. I started here in 97. We joined the NCAA in 2017. So the first 20 years of my career, we're in the NAIA, so there's a lot of great athletic directors in the NAIA that got that I got exposed to. Jim Abbott recently retired from Oklahoma City University. Jeff Bain, Martin Methodist College up in Pulaski, Tennessee, been a been a, been a great mentor. 
Um, Rob Miller was our commissioner of the uh, of the Sun Conference. Uh, he lives out in Kansas City now. Um, you know, there's just been a host of others at that era. And then you go into the NCAA and I've been fortunate. Now I got a whole new group of people that I get to learn from and be part of. And, uh, you know, Penny Parker is the athletic director at Rollins College uh, over in Winter Park. Uh, she's been there for a number of years and great to, uh, to to be involved with her. Mike Mominy down at Nova Southeastern University. Uh, Devin Crosby at Lynn University just recently announced he's taken a, a job at another institution, but he's been part of our conference for a number of years. And then also our commissioner in that league, Ed Pasquay. Uh, he lives down in the Melbourne, uh, Brevard County area there. And, and leads our, uh, our our Division II conference, the Sunshine State Conference. So those are people that I'm involved with on a regular basis. But then there are many, many others. I was fortunate. You know, you talk about professional development oftentimes as an athletic director. I was fortunate enough to be invited to, uh, to join the board uh, of NACMA, which is the Collegiate Marketing folks, National Association of Collegiate Marketing Administrators. They are a subgroup of NACDA, which is the National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics. So under NACDA, you've got the compliance folks, the marketing folks, um, you got the fundraising people and a host of other subsidiary organizations. But NACMA, the marketing folks, responsible for ticket sales and game environment and atmosphere. I got invited to be on that board and uh, and I was the only non-Division One member of the board. It's about a dozen people. Um, and they're folks who are in charge of marketing and promotions and, and what oftentimes they refer to at the Division One level called external affairs. Um, folks from South Carolina, the University of Oregon, uh, Texas A&M, uh, you know, many other big, big, big Division One schools. Uh, so I got a chance to uh, to be around those folks, Boston College, uh, University of Montana. Um, so I, I, I got a chance to be involved with other people there and see how some of their challenges were, and maybe sometimes you got to scale some of those things back. We are clearly not the same as the University of Oregon when Craig Pintons, he's now the athletic director at Loyola Marymount University in Southern California, but he was at the University of Oregon at the time. And, you know, Oregon was uh, arguably the, the the leader in social media when when Craig was there. And they certainly have some some funding assistance from uh, from from Phil Knight and the folks at Nike. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the glow in the dark, yellow and green colors and the unique uniforms and the, and the social media, probably, this probably goes back about 10, maybe even 12 years ago when not everybody was, was as interactive in the social media space as they are today. Oregon was one of the leaders and, uh, and, and, and Craig was one of the guys leading that charge. And of course, now he's leading his own division one athletic program at Loyola Marymount, but um, great guys like that that I've been part of. I, I, I can't say enough good things about professional development, whether that's your your countywide conference or your statewide conference or any of the other regional conferences that you can go to. You can learn so much there. And maybe more importantly, you can meet so many good people there so you can have some people to network with when you have a problem or need to steal an idea from. Uh, you build up that uh, that that resume of people. I don't think we call them Rolodexes anymore, but uh, yeah, that that those those folks that can help you, you need to have a bunch of them in your court. All right, no, that uh, digital uh, Rolodex. Uh, yeah, and, and again, uh, being born and raised in Oregon, growing up an Oregon Duck fan, and still very much, uh, you know, they the the saying about Phil Knight, uh, they say he's the best owner in college sports. So, uh, <laughs> right, but very cool stuff. Thanks again for sharing. Again, the the networking thing, it's just so crucial. Thanks for, you know, sharing with our listeners the extent uh of of your network. This is the Educational AD podcast. We're visiting today with John Phillips from Embry-Riddle University right here in Florida, Daytona Beach. We're going to take another break, but we'll be back with some more. This is the Educational AD podcast. We also want to say thanks to Snap Mobile. Snap Mobile is the parent company for an entire suite of platforms designed to help you do your job better. Go to snapraise.com and check out all of their platforms, Snap Store, Snap Manage, Snap Connect, and of course, Snap Raise, their fundraising platform. We used it at our school with tremendous success, and so can you. They help schools just like yours raise over $700 million dollars. They even have a program where they will give you your funding before you actually do your fundraiser. I don't think anybody else offers that. Go to snapraise.com. Check out all the ways that they can help you help your athletic department. 
That's snapraise.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. John, uh, it's that time of the podcast where I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, one of the things we try to do is share best practices. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about program and culture. And, and again, I've, I've been on your campus. Uh, I, I know it's just a tremendous uh, facility. What are some of the things at Embry-Riddle are you particularly proud of that you can share with our listeners, uh, what you might call a, a best practice? Uh, anything come to mind? Yeah, there's a couple of things, Jake. And, uh, you know, I, I talked about it earlier, but uh, really it's, it's, it starts with, with kind of knowing your purpose in life. And in this case, knowing our purpose in college athletics, we know we're at the division two level. We are a good balance at the division two level of student and athlete. We're, our games are not going to be on ESPN very often. Uh, we're not going to get players drafted into professional sports very often. Uh, and, and that's okay. We know our role and we know our purpose. Our purpose is to provide a great educational opportunity and a very good athletic program at the same time. So our, our, our brand, as I referred to earlier, is the student person player. We're very proud of that. And I'll start off with bragging a little bit about our students. Uh, they're, they're, we, we have very challenging degree programs here. Uh, all of our degrees, about 40% of our students are studying engineering. Uh, and about 30% are studying to become professional pilots. And then what people don't know is the other 30% are doing all sorts of other things. Uh, we have over 80 degree programs here from air traffic control to uh, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, homeland security, um, global conflict studies, aerospace physiology, human factors. The list is really, really long. We are really well known as a flight school and an engineering school, but we do so much more than that. And then not only do we do those things, we do them really, really well in athletics. When Coach Ritter and I were first kind of putting the program together uh, and trying to grow the program and get scholarships and one day look forward to having on-campus facilities, we talked about if we could get support from the university, we would recruit a better student than the regular student body. And I'm very happy to report that for the last 23 consecutive years, our student athletes have had a higher grade point average than the student body. 23 consecutive years, higher grade point average. So we are doing something quite well academically. We're also graduating students at a higher rate. Our retention rates are higher than the campus average. And, you know, in, in, uh, in Division II, they call it ASR, academic success rate, as opposed to GSR and some other things that they uh, that they use at the or APR that they use at the uh, at the Division I level. But the academic success rate at Embry Riddle uh, in in athletics has been very very high, and we're fortunate. Not only are we doing a really good job, but all of our partners in the Sunshine State Conference are. For as long as Division II has been measuring academic success rate. The Sunshine State Conference has finished either first or second in the country out of 23 conferences around the country. So we felt like Division II was a great fit for us because of our academic commitment, and it matched up uh, with the academic commitment of others in the Sunshine State Conference. We're very, very proud of that because uh, our students come first. You know, you want, you're going to graduate from Emory Riddle. You have a chance to get a really, really good job. And, and, and make a really good living for yourself, whether that's designing airplanes, flying airplanes, working for the Secret Service or the FBI or the Air Force or the Navy or wherever you end up, uh, our, our graduates get outstanding jobs. And again, we have to remember that's our most important task. We, we are in the education business. So we start with the student. The person part is second. We're very proud of the number of community service hours that we give back to the local Daytona Beach area on an annual basis. It's well over 3,000 hours. We haven't even finished calculating for this year yet because we still got a little bit of time left before our students go home for the summer. But uh, well over 3,000 hours will be uh, will, will be donated back to this community. And that's not the only way to be a good person, clearly, but it's one of the measurable ways. We feel really strongly that when you wear a shirt, whether that's on game day or even in the community that says Embry-Riddle across the front, that you need to represent us at a high level on and off the court in the community, at the mall, in the airport, wherever you might be, we want Embry-Riddle to be represented at a very high level. Because ultimately, as you build the brand of Embry-Riddle, when you become an alumnus and go out in the workplace, if Embry-Riddle has a good reputation, 
ultimately that's going to help you get that job, get your foot in the door with that company you're trying to get hired by. So we all have a vested interest in the brand of Embry-Riddle. Even the freshmen have a vested interest in the brand of Embry-Riddle. What they don't realize is that brand is going to be even more important to them three, four, five years later when they graduate and go out into the workplace. So that's our second pillar that we've worked really hard on is the person, the student person. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the player part is our third part. We've been very, very successful over the years. We feel like not at the expense of the first two, but if we're going to keep score, we might as well win. Uh, we've won over 120 championships uh, in the conference. Uh, we've won two team national championships. I referenced our men's basketball win in 2000. Our men's tennis team also won the NAIA national championship in 2013. And we've had 29 individual national champions, mostly in tennis and track and field, uh, where we've had a, a national high jump winner, national doubles champion, uh, a national 800 meter runner. Uh, a national hammer throw champion, and the list goes on, 29 individual national championships over the years, and uh, and multiple teams making the NCAA tournament. I know this year hasn't quite finished yet, so I'm not sure how things are going to shake out, but within, I'll say, last year and this year combined, uh, men's cross-country NCAA uh, championship qualifier, uh, women's soccer has made three consecutive NCAA championships, Men's basketball last year was a regional finalist, which is the, the Sweet 16 at Division II. Uh, softball made regionals last year in the NCAA. Men's tennis with eight, eighth in the country last year. They were in the national quarterfinals. Um, our women's rowing program finished third in the country last year. Uh, and this year, we haven't finished yet, although last Friday, just a couple 72 hours ago, we won the Sunshine State Conference Championship uh, over in Sarasota. So they will go to Dad Vales here in a couple of weeks and compete at that big regatta. And then in about four weeks, the NCAA National Championship will be held again. And uh, two years ago, we were fourth. Last year, we were third. So we're trending in the right direction. Hopefully rowing uh, here in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll have a uh, have a third national championship. But uh, we, we've had really good success, a lot, a lot of wins on the field. Uh, in a lot of our different sports. And I sure hope I didn't leave somebody out, but uh, really, really, really successful track and field. Oh, hey, the sport you've been here for. Just two weeks ago, we won the Peach Belt Conference Championship for the uh, for the fifth consecutive year, both men and women. And uh, you might have mentioned I said Peach Belt and not Sunshine State. The Sunshine State Conference, we are the only school in the Sunshine State Conference that offers track and field. So there's it's not a championship sport in our primary conference. So we are affiliate members of the Peach Belt Conference up into Georgia and South Carolina uh, as a as a track and field competitor. And we were fortunate enough to get to host the meet uh, this past year on our campus. And like I said, both the men and the women won uh, the Peach Belt Championship. So we've been uh, we've been very, very successful on the field and on the court. But again, it still all starts with the student athletes in the classroom. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I really appreciate you uh, going through those three pillars. You know, John, if one of our listeners uh, and listeners, I think you got a tremendous resource here. Uh, if they wanted to reach out, pick your brain about, you know, they can see now, you know, wow, you know, national presence. But as you and I know, you know, it didn't start that way. Yeah. Uh, if they wanted to reach out, maybe pick your brain a little bit about, you know, the process. What's the best way they can get a hold of you? There's a lot of ways. Uh, the easiest one is probably just to shoot me an email. And it's it, it's pretty simple. It's just just like my name, John with an H, John dot Phillips, P-H-I-L-L, -L, two L's, I-P-S, at E-R-A-U dot E-D-U. So John dot Phillips at E-R-A-U dot E-D-U. Uh, need more information than that? You can go to E-R-A-U athletics dot com. That's our athletic department website. My contact info is on there as well, along with all of our coaches. And then the other way in today's day and age that I'm pretty active in and a lot of uh, especially high school kids tend to tend to reach out is on Twitter. Um, and my Twitter handle is JP, as in John Phillips, JP underscore Daytona, JP underscore Daytona. Uh, there's a lot of young men and women out there who are trying to uh, get recruited. And I don't blame them one bit because our coaches can't be everywhere. And uh, so they'll reach out to me on Twitter. They'll follow me. They'll send me DMs. They'll send me highlight videos. And quite honestly, every single one of those I get, I pass along to our coaches. 
I can't guarantee that every one of those kids is a recruitable college athlete, but that's not my job. My job is to try to connect them with coaches and uh, that, that it, I, I do it with every, every one I get, if they have a question and as long as they're eligible to be recruited. And of course right. the, the new date is coming up here soon, June 15th, prior to your junior year. So if you're a freshman or a sophomore and you reach out to the coach, the division two rule is we can't be recruiting you actively until June 15th prior to your junior year. So uh, for those freshmen and sophomores that have reached out, I do respond to them and I tell them, unfortunately, we can't recruit you yet. So I do want them to know that I've received their message. But if you do email a coach and you're a freshman or a sophomore in high school, don't be res don't be surprised to not get a response back because technically uh, NCAA rules prohibit us from uh, from recruiting you. But from my perspective as an AD, I'm not recruiting. I'm just sharing information. I do the same thing to parents. I say, hey, reach out after June 15th. Here's the email of the coach and uh, and help them with the process because uh, it, it can be very confusing. And the rules of Division One and Division Two are different in a lot of areas. And even in the NAI and Division Three, the rules are different. But uh, for those folks that are listening, uh, and, I, and I know a lot of the, your, your your listeners are in the in the high school athletic director space, don't discourage your athletes from reaching out directly. We can't recruit everybody or know where everybody is. Some of the best players have found us instead of us finding them. So uh, keep uh, keep doing it. If you want to pursue a great education uh, at Embry Riddle, again, John Phillips at erau.edu. Or, uh, or on Twitter at JP underscore Daytona. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'm more than happy to uh, play the role to connect people to the right to the right uh, coach or the right place or pass along any of the lessons we've learned. That's one of the things I, I almost feel obligated. Uh, people have shared with me so much uh, great information and best practices over the years that it's my turn to, uh, to pass those lessons along. And I would welcome the chance to share with anybody who's interested. Uh, again, really appreciate you sharing that process about recruiting because not everybody, even some ADs, you know, they're not aware of it. And we'll give that contact information out again at the end. Once again, our guest today is John Phillips. He is the director of athletics at Embry Riddle University in Daytona Beach. We're going to take another break, but stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to say thanks to Huddle for their support of the podcast. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. As a head football coach, I used Huddle for years, but when I became an athletic director, I made sure our school was a Huddle school. And all of our coaches, you know, volleyball, basketball, soccer, you name it, really loved the tools that Huddle provided for them and for our teams and our athletes. Uh, Huddle's going to give you a professional-grade solution to the challenges that we all face as AEDs and leaders. Go to huddle.com and see why we believe in sports and teams believe in huddle. Join the 6 million users. Find out how to turn your school into a huddle school. <clears throat> Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Uh, our guest today is John Phillips from Embry-Riddle University in Daytona. Uh, John and I were talking during the break and uh, athletic directors wear a lot of different hats. And uh, John was mentioning uh, a couple of different hats that he's had the opportunity to wear. Uh, and I thought it'd be interesting for our listeners. So John, uh, can you share that? Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it, it goes back to 1997 when I first started here at Emory Riddle. Uh, like I mentioned, I was the director of sports marketing. That was my official title, which is what I thought I did most of the day. And uh I, 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 we roll into basketball season. We're about a month away from the start of basketball season. And, and as I mentioned previously, the basketball coach was the athletic director at the time. And he came to me and said, uh, Hey, uh, I'd, I'd like you to be on the broadcast team for our basketball games. Uh, and we only had men's basketball at the time. Didn't have women's basketball. So it was only men's basketball. I'd like you to be on the broadcast uh, team for the basketball games. And I was like, coach, you remember I played baseball here not basketball. I don't know that much about basketball. He goes, well, we got a local, you know, DJ, he does the play by play. You'll do the color commentary. You'll be fine. So I jump in, I put the headset on and I, I do a year of color commentary and I'm glad we don't have any tapes of it because it was probably horrendous, but I studied really hard and I listened to, you know, the Dick Vitale and all the other guys that are on ESPN and tried to, 
you know, model myself after some of those folks. I come back, I get another year under my belt and, uh, you know, hopefully it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Well, then we go into getting ready for year three and he comes to me and says, Hey, you know, Bob, that was Bob Bells, our former play by play guy. Bob's going to retire. He's moving up to Atlanta to be near his grandkids wanting you to take over the play by play instead of the, just being the color guy. And like, coach, remember I'm, I've, I've never done play by play because ah, you'll be fine. So strap the headset on. And uh, of course, what, what happens that year? Well, I mentioned earlier, we won the national championship. Uh, so we went all the way to the final game. I got to be the play-by-play -play voice of the Eagles for uh, arguably our most successful season ever. Um, just a, a dream come true to be on the call for a national championship. Um, bottom line is those games are being played on a local radio station here in Daytona beach called WNDB local AM station. And uh I don't know who's listening to WNDB, but clearly somebody was uh, a couple of years later, I get a phone call and they said, Hey, uh, we're going to be uh, expanding our high school football coverage here for uh, mainland high school and Seabreeze high school. And like you to join the play by play team. I'm like, well, I played football in high school. I've never done football play by play, but yeah, you'll be fine. Jump on in there. Um, so I do that for a few more years Again, fast forward, this this story does actually have a point to it. Uh, you roll into about 2011. And again, I don't know who all is listening, but clearly some people are listening to me. I get a phone call. I was actually at a professional development conference. I was in Rochester, New York, and I got a phone call from the radio station. Again, this is June. They said, uh, hey, uh, you've done a really good job on our high school football. Uh, we would like you to join our broadcast team uh, for NASCAR. Uh, and on July 4th, uh, at that time, I think it was still called the, the the Pepsi 400. I don't think it made the transition, whereas today that race is is now called the Coke Zero Sugar 400. Uh, but they said, hey, we want you to join our... I was like, I don't know that much about NASCAR. And, and of course, I got the same line from them that I got from Coach Ritter. Ah, you'll be fine. That's why we're calling you in June. The race isn't until July. Uh, so I jump in. I become a NASCAR uh, uh, broadcaster for for MRN for the Motor Racing Network for the flagship station here in uh, in Daytona Beach. The following year, I move into the Daytona 500. The following year, the Rolex 24, and uh, here later this summer, when the Coke Zero Sugar 400 race comes back, I'll be back in the broadcast booth once again. So, uh, long story short, if somebody offers you an opportunity, don't be afraid to take it. Uh, I was a little nervous at taking the opportunity, but again, Coach Ritter's words were, you'll be fine. Well, that play by or color commentary led to play by play, led to football. Clearly, somebody at the radio station was listening to me do football. That led to motorsports. And, and, and now I get to go to the Great American Race as a broadcaster, uh, along with the Rolex 24 and, uh, and virtually any other race over at Daytona uh, International Speedway. It's one of the joys of being. Uh, being close to the racetrack is I have a lot of opportunities over there. So I guess the lesson is, you know, when somebody offers you an opportunity, don't be afraid to take it because it's worked out pretty good for me. I haven't, uh, I haven't messed it up too badly yet because they keep inviting me back. Oh, absolutely. I'm very jealous. Uh, and, and you're right about the changing of sponsorships that uh, Coke zero sugar 400 just doesn't roll off the tongue. Like, you know, Pepsi for, not true, yeah. but Heck, there's still some people that call it the firecracker 400 exactly that's what it was on remember, july 4th way back in the day before we all started making money on sponsorships and had uh title sponsors and things but uh yeah the history of nascar is obviously really big here in daytona beach and it's evolved over the years and we've actually come full circle now this year in the truck series we're back to the craftsman truck series uh which used to be craftsman trucks and then it switched uh as mm -hmm. the as the business of of of, of trucks and tools and sears uh evolved over the years but uh yeah it, it's it's fun to keep up with but it's a it's a full-time job sometimes with the uh with, with the sponsorships no that's uh again very jealous that's very cool uh this has just been uh really neat getting to know you a little bit and uh hearing about the embry riddle programs but we're not done yet uh, we always wrap up with the athletic director's toolbox now our listeners obviously know that you uh have been in athletics for a long time and know your way around the world but uh, we're going to take our final break we're going to hear from athletic surveys who sponsor our toolbox segment when we come back we're going to challenge you to send out a brand new athletic director 
on the very first job, but I'm only going to let you put three things mm. in their toolbox. So let's take that last mm -hmm. break here from Athletic Surveys. When we come back, we're going to hear what John Phillips is going to put in his new athletic director toolbox. Please stay with us. We want to thank Athletic Surveys for sponsoring the ED Toolbox segment. Athletic Surveys are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire athletic program. ADs usually only get feedback from the complainers, that squeaky wheel parent, or maybe it's a frustrated student athlete. And we need to hear from them so we can affect positive change in our program. But we also need to hear back from the 98% that love and support our program. And that's where Athletic Surveys comes in. They're going to create a custom survey for your school that allows you to take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with that squeaky wheel parent or your principal or your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. Let them show you how to take that survey and use that data to continue to improve your programs. Go to athleticsurveys.com to get started. Athletic Surveys, helping you take your program from good to great. Well, we've come to the final segment of the podcast. We've been visiting with John Phillips, the Director of Athletics at Embry-Riddle University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, has spent, I, I dare say, a life in athletics. But uh, right now, I'm going to challenge him to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job, but I'm only going to let him put three items in their toolbox. So, John, what three items are going to go into your new athletic director toolbox? You know, I was thinking about this for, uh, for, for a little bit, trying to come up with some things that were unique. And, I, of course, I've listened to some of the other uh, previous guests that you've had on. So, I'm going to start with one that is uh, is not something you can uh, can can tangibly pack, but intangibly you need to pack with you every every day of the week, especially as an athletic director. And that is pack your patience. Uh, and I don't mean patience as in the medical kind, but uh, but pack your patience for people and your patience for dealing with things, because uh, rarely do things go off the way you expect them to. Uh, every athletic event I've ever been to. It happens live, and sometimes things happen. Uh, sometimes it rains. Sometimes the power goes out. Uh, you, I, I could go on for, for for days and weeks about some of the things that we've experienced uh, over the years. So uh, you just got to pack a good attitude and a lot of patience. And I think that goes with even when you're not an athletic director. Uh, just pack your patience. If you're if you're driving down the interstate and traffic gets in your way. Pack your patience. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't drive yourself crazy. Well, one of the things we like to say around here is control the controllables. Don't worry about things that are outside of your control. Be prepared. Have a plan. But don't stress about the things that are out of your control, especially the weather. Oh, what if it rains later tonight? It doesn't matter if you worry about it. It's still going to rain or not, as the case may be. But but have a have a game plan for, uh, for what happens when it rains. So uh, pack your patience. Uh, the other thing I would say, and 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 I, and I written down this in a, in a different way, and I kind of spun it now a little bit differently after what you were saying earlier, uh, Jake. Uh, pack your diversity of thought. Everybody's got a different approach to certain things, and sometimes I think as a young athletic director, and even as a young employee, I felt like here's the way we're going to do it, and that's the way we're going to do it because I said that's the way we're going to do it. Um, don't be afraid to listen to others' opinions uh, about all sorts of things, not just how to do something, but just diversity of thought, period. Uh, I think that served us really, really well. And I can reference a couple of meetings that I was in early on in my athletic director career uh, with our senior woman administrator. Uh, she had joined our team here in athletics after a long career in student affairs. Uh, and and she, she would tell me oftentimes, because you know, I don't have that much experience in college athletics. And I would tell her, Sanja, that's one of the reasons we hired you, because you have a different opinion and a different set of background and values. She had been the dean of students at Embry-Riddle. She had been the director of housing at Embry-Riddle, and she'd been the associate vice president for student affairs. So she had seen a lot of different things from a lot of different perspectives. And I really wanted to get her perspective as somebody 
who wasn't in athletics uh, on a daily basis. And that really served me and served our department very well. So if you can't pack Sanja Taylor, who's one of my all-time favorite employees that worked with me, and you can't anymore because she's retired and she moved to North Carolina, uh, but pack someone like her who has diversity of thought. Having everybody the same, it, do it doesn't help you. You got to hire people that are smarter than you and bring a different skill set. Some people are good at websites. Some people are good at cutting the grass. Those two people don't need to be the same person all the time. They could be, but let's make sure we have a diversity of thought and a diversity of skill set. On our, on our teams. And then the last thing I have in, in my toolbox, you're going to need a really big toolbox for this one. Always have a backup plan. And this comes to me from radio. And it, and it really popped into my mind when I was talking to you earlier about being a broadcaster. And I'm really fortunate today to go to the media center at Daytona International Speedway and plug in my headset and talk about motorsports because they do all the work for me. I just show up and talk. But early on in my career as an NAI play-by-play -play guy, I was toting the 750 foot long spool of phone line into the gym and trying to find a working phone line to tap into the radio station to broadcast the game. And I, I also learned a critical question. This happened to me one time. <clears throat> I was doing a high school football game. I was doing DeLand at Lake Brantley. And they have a beautiful press box at Lake Brantley. And I asked the wrong question. I said, do you have a phone line in the press box? And their answer was, yes. I should have asked, do you have a working phone line in the press box? Because <laughs> I would have got a different answer. Um, but fortunately, I had that 750-foot spool of phone wire in my car, and I ran it out the back of the press box, dropped it down into the parking lot, and across the way into a building where I could plug in and get access to a phone line because the show must go on. And I was able to get a phone line that night and broadcast the game. Uh, other times, I haven't been as lucky. The backup phone hasn't been as close. <clears throat> but I've always had my cell phone, which isn't as great, but in some ways still gets the game on the air. Uh, but the bottom line is whether you work in radio or anything else, always have a backup plan. That might mean having a backup set of clothes because it rains and you get wet. A backup set of shoes because you got to go to a meeting after the game and your shoes got dirty on the sideline. It could mean a host of different things, but uh, always have a backup plan um, because you never know uh, what's going to happen, especially in uh, in intercollegiate athletics or even high school athletics, competitive athletics of any way, shape or size. Um, every game's live. You don't get a do over. And you never know what's going to happen. So always be prepared. A good uh, a good Boy Scout slogan goes a long way in, in the world of athletics. I loved your comment about every game you've ever been to. It's been live. Uh, I, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I wrote that down. I, I'm, I'm stealing that. I'm letting you know. And as far as the, the telephone cable uh back i'm a little bit older than you and you know one of my good friends had a production company out of college and i uh helped him with a number of remote podcasts mm -hmm. i know exactly what you're talking about with that phone line our younger listeners have no idea what we're talking about yeah i've spliced lines together I, i've done all sorts of tricks and one of the things i learned as they transitioned into these digital phone systems uh, if you could just find a fax machine. Now, we don't have fax machines anymore, it seems like, but maybe back about 10, maybe 12 years ago, when all these digital phone systems were great, but from a broadcaster's perspective, they were horrible because they just didn't work the same. But if you could find a POTS line, a plain old tele telephone service line, usually that was the fax machine. You could uh, you could get your get your game on the air. And uh, that's ultimately the end goal. Get the game on the air because right. mom and grandma are back home waiting to listen to the game. And uh, I always felt like it was my job somehow, some way to get the game on the air. And I'm happy to say, knock on wood, I've never had a game not get on the air in all my, I don't know how many games I've done. It's well over a thousand because uh, I've got uh, mo over 800 basketball games at Embry Riddle alone. Uh, I did every home and every away game uh, for 22 consecutive years at one point, uh, wow. plus all the high school games I did. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've seen a lot of gyms. I've seen a lot of football fields. Uh, I did the final four game in the state playoffs one time uh, at night. I, I, I did the state championship game at one o'clock at the Citrus Bowl. 
and then a Final Four game later that same night at a, at a different stadium at Apopka. That was a really great broadcaster's day without getting too far off offline. It was uh, it was Warner Christian, and I think it was Glades Day. Maybe they played in the state championship in the 1A at the Citrus Bowl at 1 o'clock, and then I drove to Apopka for the for the uh, 6 or 7A semifinal game between DeLand and Apopka. Uh, same day, two two venues, two really important high school football games, and uh, both incredibly fun to be part of. Wow. Okay. Again, really appreciate you sharing all that. One more time, John, if one of our listeners wants to uh, reach out and connect with you, pick your brain a little bit more, what's the best way they can get a hold of you? Yeah, best way is through uh, through email, john.phillips, john.phillips at erau.edu, uh, Twitter, jp underscore Daytona, or they can also just go visit our website, which is erauathletics.com. That's got my uh, phone number, email, bio, uh, along with info for all of our coaches as well. If, uh, if we can help you as an athletic director or as a parent who's trying to get your son or daughter recruited or anything else to do with, uh, with, with collegiate athletics, I am uh, more than happy to, uh, to, to get a phone call or an email and uh, share any of the wisdom I've gained over the last uh, 30 plus years, uh, more, more than willing to pass it along. Just like, just like you're doing on your podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same business, sharing, sharing lessons learned and really enjoy doing it. Oh, absolutely. Appreciate you sharing today. Um, for our listeners, uh, we do this just about every day and we upload the zoom recordings to the educational AD podcast, YouTube channel. We appreciate your support. Come back next time for another episode of the educational AD and John, thanks uh, to you for uh, being on. My pleasure being part of it. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll see everybody next time. Take care.